Thank you, George, for a very interesting and insightful presentation on the history of interactive interactivity in art. And I also want to thank uh, the Dali Museum for uh, putting this special series together and collaborating with us. And uh, I'll introduce myself as well. I'm Mikhail Manchin. I'm co-founder of Fairground St. Pete, an immersive art and technology experience uh, opening soon, and also the co-organizer of OK Transmit, an art and technology meetup also based here in St. Pete. OK Transmit's an open meetup for anyone seeking to engage in cross-disciplinary art and technology practices. Uh, and also for context, uh, George Fifield was my professor and also my thesis advisor at the Rhode Island School of Design, uh, where I completed my MFA in Digital Plus Media. So I'll be hosting the Q&A portion of the talk this evening, and we invite uh, everyone to ask George any questions, and you can insert them in the chat. So just to keep it organized, we'll, we'll do it this way, and then I will uh, field the questions to George. And um, in the meantime, I wanted to go over a couple questions that we received previously. Uh, so without further ado, let's get started. George, how did you become interested in new media art history and also in curating and collecting? Um, can you tell us more about how you got your start? Uh, let's see, I was an artist many years ago and at one point realized I was better at showing other people's art than making my own. So that led me into curating. Um, I was curating um, techno technological art, which is uh, especially at the beginning, video art, and became video art curator uh, at a wonderful museum in um, Lincoln, Mass, uh, the De Cordova. And uh, as a result, um, but I was starting to really explore other things. And I remember distinctly, one of the ways I supported myself also was to being a, a um, uh, graphic designer. And I was there right at this moment when graphic design took off from something you did completely by hand to something you did completely in the computer. It, when PageMaker showed up and things like that. I still think I know how to cast type, which is something nobody needs to know ever. <laughs> um, and uh, so that jump really interested me in and in what were artists doing with it. And that was really, that's what got my start. And then a few years later, I started a, um, the, I started writing a column for Art New England on art and technology. And in writing the column, I realized that the Boston area, the greater um, Boston area was one of the epicenters of artists working in new technologies. And some of the finest practitioners of it lived right around us. So I started the Boston Cyber Arts Festival to celebrate that. Um, so that's how I got my start. Oh, thank you. That's, that's fascinating. I didn't, I don't think I realized you were a graphic designer, even after having you as professor. I, I still, I still do it. I still can be a, a bit of a, a, a jock on, on, on that kind of stuff. So for those that might not be familiar, uh, what is Boston Cyber Arts and what is the motivation for representing these kinds of works that now in your gallery? Um, so we have, we have two big projects and then a third very variable project. The two big projects are the uh, Art on the Marquee, which is that in front of the South Boston Convention Center is an 80 foot tall, seven screen, three sided LED sculpture. And it's there to tell about the conventions and to show advertisements and PSAs. But their interest in showing local art that led them to us and we have been now since 2011 curating a exhibition of uh, regular um, different exhibitions of video art and new media art on this marquee. And it's momentarily halted just because the convention center doesn't have any conventions right now, as we all know, um, but I hope it will start up again this year. Um, but already at this time from 2012, really till today, we've um, put over 300 um, videos on there, 30 second videos on there. Uh, the other thing we do is the gallery and we curate, I curate and we invite others to curate different things on art and technology. 
um, and about people who are about artists who, who work in new technologies. Um, I think that one of the interesting things is that whenever a new expressive technology appears, artists are really some of the first people there. As I said in my talk, when the World Wide Web appeared, artists were there before um, business and before pornography. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's because they, they are dying to try something new um, and, and to express themselves in a new format. And that fascinates me. And it's something I keep wanting to explore. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. And that marquee went up, or you started that project, 2011 is when I graduated from, from RISD in your class. And I know some of my classmates went on to show work on that, uh, on that platform. Number of them. Well, yeah. Yep. Um, so I know we have some artists watching today and, uh, who are also interested in art and technology. So could you share a little bit about some of those artists that you've represented and, or maybe some more recently? Well, um, I, some some of them who have uh, we've done because they recently passed away. For example, a wonderful example is Otto Pina, who uh, ran the um, Center for Advanced Visual Studies at MIT for many years and showed art of different sorts all over the world and was particularly interested in inflatable art. Um, in fact, uh, he's very famous for the um, having put together uh, the inflatable sculpture that um, ended the, what was it, 1973 uh, Olympics in Germany after the attack by the terrorists. Right. And it was really a, a beautiful sort of ending to this very horrible um, Olympic moment. Um, and uh, we've had shows on math and art. We've had shows on biology and art. Uh, we've, I had a very interesting show on artificial intelligence and art, which was sponsored by Google. And I really didn't know anything about it at that point. It probably learned, this is the fastest, hardest learning experience of my life was to figure out what was good, who the players were and who were the good ones. But we put together, I think a pretty good show. So it's that kind of thing. Um, right now we're closed. The gallery is not open to the public. But we have a couple advantages. One, we have a lot of windows wrapping around the gallery. And two, uh, we're in next, right next door to the T station, the, the subway in Boston. So we get a lot of foot traffic. So what I did was take all of our monitors and put them in the windows. And we're doing what we call the window show. And artists have been putting new media art on these monitors so that as people walk by, they can see it. And I think it's been very successful. We're on our fourth artist. Uh, Ann Spalter, an artist from Brooklyn, uh, who does really, really beautiful work. Very nice. Uh, we have a question from Essig. Uh, hello. What keeps you coming back to immersive art? And what do you think the future holds for immersive art? Uh, do you feel the public will adopt it full heartedly? Well, it's an interesting question to put the public first. In this case, it was adopted by artists before the public um, even got wind of it, you know. Um, as, as I sort of try to explain, it was the artists themselves. There's a wonderful line um, by Alex Ross, the music critic, who called it in a book on music, the abdication of control. Mm -hmm. And artists really wanted to get rid of this. I'm doing 100% of this. And so it started with let chance do it or let the, let the musicians do it or let uh, the audience do it or let the computer do it and, um, or let the reader active person do it. So this idea that the artists were the ones who created interactivity in their art forms um, and the audience just had to find it. So far, I haven't heard very many complaints from the audience. Um, and I think the future is going to be what new technologies come along that can be explored this way. I think some of the old technologies are going to continue as they always do. Um, but uh, some new technologies are really right on our doorstep and are, are going to really have an impact on, on interactivity and have an impact on the arts. Yeah, no doubt. Um, well, that's interesting. It leads to another question that we had from uh, before, which was the about the history of interactivity in art. Um, it seems very intertwined with invention. 
and radio, television, computer, internet, uh, as you illustrated in your talk. So from your perspective, what do you think the role then of the artist becomes when society is confronted with something new, a new invention, maybe even a new paradigm? Um, I think I'd start this by saying that all art mediums are inventions. Oil painting was, for example, a big invention. We can track the history of oil painting to its very beginning. And the early days of oil painting were very much, I have the secret of oil painting and I'm not telling anyone. Um, and uh, so that really can't happen with technologies that are getting, that get patents these days. But, um, but I think that as new technologies happen and artists find out about them, they will be there using them. Um, what was, what was the, how, phrase the question one more time. Yeah, it was sort of what is the kind of function or the role of the artist um, as these new inventions come about? It, it seems like they serve as kind of an avant-garde to go and even define it as a medium for creation sometimes. I, I, think, I think that's exactly what they do. Um, in many cases, they're the first people to try and experiment with it. And in many times while they're experimenting, it, they break it um, yeah. as a medium, but they usually look up and say, well, that's what I, my intent was. Um, that's something artists can get away with that others can't. Um, Nam June Paik is a wonderful example. He did almost everything that could be done with video um, from, from individual um, short videos to inst installations with many video monitors, to all these different video formats, even to making bras out of video. Um, and, uh, and so as a result, even today in video art, you really can't, are hard to find somebody who's doing something that Nam June in some format didn't do. And that's, I think, what usually happens with these early um, adapters of technology. They, they explore all the different ways. And the people who invented technology are looking on going, wow, I didn't know it could do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's fascinating. We have a question from Keith also. Uh, you referenced the history of technology and art. So what relevance do you think um, Marshall McLuhan's The Medium is the Message Declaration has today? Um, I'm a huge McLuhanist fan. Uh, and I think that it's, it's very much uh, still a, a truth um, that when a new media comes along, it not, only, it, it not only has its own power, but it also has the power to adapt the way we think mm -hmm. and the way, the way the culture thinks. So um, television, of course, was the one I grew up with and really had a huge impact on the entire culture of the time, um, but now computers are the big one. And I think, you know, it's very interesting to see how um, culture is, is bending to the concept of the computer um, and, and redefining itself as information. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's true. That's interesting. It, it sort of gives shape to uh, culture and then we respond to that. Um, so with all of the technology as kind of at the heart of many of these new media artworks, uh, do you think that artists need to be engineers to make new media or interactive work? Um, what would be a piece of advice that you could give to, say, an emerging artist uh, interested in this style of work today? A piece of advice I would give would be learn code. Okay. Um, I would think that, that being able to code is, for an artist today, uh, uh, who's, who is interested in this kind of technology is an invaluable um, skill. Um, there are even code languages that were written specifically for artists. Uh, the most famous is Processing, um, written by um, uh, Casey Reese and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and Ben. And, um, and it was designed so artists could use a particular language um, to make their art. Um, and there's more than that going on. Uh, it's probably more interesting if you, there are certainly a lot of artists who have gotten away with 
just learning a off the shelf piece of software or an off the shelf piece of technology, but it's always more interesting if you can manipulate it yourself. Agreed. I can get behind that. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you see, so we're in a really interesting time period uh, living through this pandemic, but living through the world, it's the first pandemic the world has lived through with internet. Mm -hmm. um, so are, do you see any trends emerging in art and technology through COVID or maybe due to COVID? Um, that's, that's interesting. I mean, it's clearly that doing exactly what we're doing now, right. that this meeting online, because we can't meet, I can't come down to Tampa and it's, is, is very expansive in a way. I mean, there are obviously people right now listening to us who aren't in Tampa and, and wouldn't normally be. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that's great. One of the little things, the tiny things that, I, that has really struck me as a technological advance has been the fact that you can get people in many, many different places performing music together. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you see that all the time where they're, they're actually performing in different places at this, you know, at this, on the same piece of music and it works. And I find that every time I see that, I just find that stunning as how did they get away with that? <laughs> yes, it's always such a latency problem. Yeah. Um, well, you know, we're, that's actually a really great place to end, I think. Um, what we, oh, I'm going to take one more question here, uh, also from Keith. Uh, so, George, what, what are you learning from Gen Zs and millennials that you have incorporated uh, in your own art or, or in your curation? Um, well, I have to say that I've, I've stopped teaching um, the course at, at RISD um, just because I sort of, and I'm kind of glad I did because I don't think I could do it um, from a distance teaching. But I learned more from my students than I did. <laughs> I think they learned from me. They would always tell me about new things that were going on that I'd never heard of. So, um, uh, you know, all sorts of useful tricks for how to manipulate technology. And I'm always on the list, I'm always on the lookout for that. And that's a, that's a sort of a youthful thing, I think. Yep, it's give and take. I know, I'm, I'm getting to the phase now where I have to be taught a lot of uh, <laughs> all the new things that are happening. So Mikhail, that means you're getting older, right? <laughs> Oh yeah, that's the, that's the other way to say that. <laughs> Mikhail, this is Kim. I'm driving, so I can't type, but I do have a question. Please. Hi, Kim. Hi, George. That was awesome. Thank you so much for giving this talk. And um, oh, thank you for having me. This has been great fun. Yeah, when you were when you were talking about, especially about artists as innovators, you know, I do a lot of work in that area, thinking about um, Dali as an innovator, and you know. Mm -hmm it really struck a chord with me when you said that they're the first to jump on something because he was like that with holograms, you know, as soon as yeah. like holograms came out, you know, he was trying to make art with them. And I was just wondering, um, do you think that artists as a group are just more innovative or do you think that there's the same kind of curve with artists, in the general population, that there's that small set of early adopters and then, you know, that next set of like, okay, we're next. And then you got your laggards and I will, click off so you can answer. That's an interesting question, Kim. I, I, I'm afraid as a curator, I must admit that there are a lot of conservative art. There's a lot of conservative art in the world. And um, there are a lot of people who they just would like painted rectangles. And I have nothing, nothing against that. Um, however, I'm looking for the maybe small population of artists that are really trying to find a new technology and see what they can do and maybe even break it in some way to make art with. And so, um, yeah, I, th I think they probably um, uh, reflect the general population of conservative versus radically radical thinking. Awesome. Thanks for the question, Kim. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Thank you all. Uh, Thank you, George, and thank you all. We look forward to seeing you at our next meetup and have a great night. Bye-bye. Good night.